Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for tuning in to the Moose Family Speaker Series today. First, a few logistics. We expect a good number of folks streaming in from around the world. So we welcome you to use the chat to tell us who you are, where you're streaming in from, and one reason water matters to you. Please also use the chat to submit questions throughout today's webinar. Make sure your chat is sent to everyone using the drop down bar directly above the chat box. To give ample time for a panel discussion, today's webinar will run until 1.30. We have turned on closed captioning. You can hide it by clicking on the live transcript button on your screen. So my name is Valerie Forbes. I'm a member of the board of Freshwater, a Minnesota nonprofit working toward a vision of clean and safe water for us all. Since 1968, Freshwater has been a leading public nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving freshwater resources and their surrounding watersheds. I'm also the Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Biological Sciences. Today, it is our pleasure to host the Moose Family Speaker Series on Water Resources, a lecture series named after the late Malcolm Moose president of the University of Minnesota from 1967 to 1974. Freshwater and CBS have partnered together for years to bring cutting edge science on water from around the world to new audiences. The timing of today's event is extra special for two reasons. First, we're lucky to have this event fall during Native American Heritage Month, which recognizes indigenous people's knowledge, history, and culture. This talk would not be possible without indigenous expertise and lived experience that change how we tackle environmental issues. Second, now through tomorrow is Give to the Max Day in Minnesota, a statewide giving day when thousands of people donate to their favorite causes. While Freshwater welcomes your donations, we encourage you to support an indigenous organization with a donation today. We will put some local suggestions in the chat or you can find them on our website's Moose Lecture page. Before I introduce Dr. McGregor, please join me in giving a special thank you to today's generous sponsors, including Midewakan Katan Sioux Community, a federally recognized sovereign Dakota tribal government located southwest of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Following a Dakota tradition of generosity, they are a top philanthropist in Minnesota and leader in protecting natural resources. Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, a state agency committed to creating a healthy, sustainable, and livable Minnesota. Minnesota Department of Health, committed to building up health equity in Minnesota so that all communities can thrive. Minnesota Environmental Quality Board, a forum for leadership and coordination across Minnesota state agencies on complex priority environmental issues, and the Consulate General of Canada in Minneapolis, providing services to Canadians visiting and living in the US. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah McGregor. Dr. McGregor holds a doctorate in forestry from the University of Toronto, as well as a master's degree in environmental studies from York University, and a bachelor of science in psychology from the University of Toronto. Currently at York University in Ontario, Dr. McGregor is the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Environmental Justice and cross-appointed in Osgoode Hall, Hall Law School and the Faculty of Environment and Urban Change. Her research has focused on Indigenous knowledge systems and their various applications in diverse contexts, including environmental and water governance, environmental justice, health, and environment climate, ch climate change, and indigenous legal traditions. Prior to her position at York, she worked with Environment Canada with a focus on the Great Lakes. Dr. McGregor is from Whitefish River First Nation, Anishinaabe, Birch Island, Ontario, and has been at the forefront of indigenous environmental justice and indigenous research theory and practice. Dr. McGregor, the screen is yours.
to me, Gwetch, for that introduction and for having me, all the sponsors and everybody who's who's joining us today. Um, I was pretty excited to receive this invitation and uh, because there's so much to say about the Great Lakes um, and uh, and actually became overwhelming. So I actually put together a presentation to try to organize my thinking because professionally I've been working on um, Great Lakes for 25 years. But of course, as a uh, Anishinaabe person um, from Whitefish River First Nation, I've been like living living with the Great Lakes um, all my life. Um, so I've been think about it all the time. Like right now I'm, I'm in the city of Toronto. If I were at home, literally I'd be able to look out and see McGregor Bay, ironically, and uh, of Lake Huron. So uh, I grew up um, surrounded by water. So I am going to try to, um, what, what I committed to is, was commenting on sort of the changes that I've seen over time in terms of Indigenous participation in the Great Lakes um, initiatives, whether it's by generally federal governments in both Canada and the United States, federal um, or provincial and state governments through different kinds of agreements, because those are a lot of um, the work that I've been engaged with, with Chiefs of Ontario that I work with. And when I was with um, Environment Canada, I realized um, for 10 years, over 10 years ago, when I went to the academy full time. So hopefully I make sense in, in my comments and, and also in addressing um, environmental justice. And, but it's, it's a lot to jam in there. But I did want to provide a bit of context for, for where I'm coming from in terms, of, um, in terms of my remarks today. And hopefully I'll stay within the timeline of a half an hour to 40 minutes because I'm really excited to engage uh, with the panel um, with, with uh, other panelists because they have so much knowledge and, and I will learn a lot from them and from you uh, with your questions when we engage um, in dialogue. I just like how people are, are indicating where they're from and um, in the chat as well. So I'm going to share a screen. So it worked five minutes ago. So hopefully it'll continue to work. One never knows um, how this is actually going to happen. All right. Um, so I'm assuming people are seeing what I'm seeing, uh, you can just send me a chat or something, Claire, to, to make sure that we're all looking at the same thing. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about environmental um, justice as part of the Great Lakes initiatives. So it's always come up. It's actually more like injustice in conversations that I've had over, over many years um, with different uh, Indigenous peoples that I've been working with, or even in my own community in terms of how people um, experience, I guess, other people's initiatives to, to govern or to protect or to conserve, um, conserve, restore the Great Lakes. Um, and a lot of the times uh, indigenous communities and, and nations are in this position of having to um, put energy into reacting to that as opposed to engaging in their own, um, engaging in their own governance in terms of how they want to relate to relate to the Great Lakes. So, but one of the reports that that actually um, I wanted to point out, I'm just going to point this out <laughs> this way. Um, environmental injustice in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So this was an Indigenous caucus. This was 1997, an Indigenous caucus that presented to the International Joint Commission, where they outlined. I don't have time to go into the to their preamble and whereas statements, but they did speak to the um, importance of the Great Lakes to Indigenous um, survival and, and not just surviving but flourishing and, and how there were particular um, injustices due to lack of um, involvement, participation and decision making around the, around the Great Lakes. I am, um, I guess you could say over my career, you don't ever really notice this I think from year to year, but over time, over, over 25 years, you do notice some inroads being made um, so, for example, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement um, didn't really recognize uh, tribes or First Nations or traditional knowledge, and, and now they started to kind of get there. You didn't see that when I started my career, but now you do. So, but that's a lot of advocacy by many people to make those kind of um, inroads happen. So... Of the many years that I've been working um, in relation to the Great Lakes, this has always been um, pointed out. Like sometimes we would start off with almost like who we are like right now, 
because really who we are right now, we're trying to operate pretty well as indigenous people within colonial state. But that's not really all of our history. Most of our history is, is thousands of years old being um, and relating to, to the Great Lakes. And I've always had elders and traditional knowledge holders, keepers and practitioners and grandmothers and grandfathers, particularly grandmothers who always said, it always starts with spirit. It took a while for that to sink in, but now, but now I, I know that's where, where we have to start always the conversation, that, um, that we always start with spirit in terms of our conversations um, around water or almost anything to do, with, um, to do with the natural world, for lack of a better word. But we were here for thousands of years and we had knowledge that we passed on to engage in sustainable relationships at all of creation. I'm not saying we're perfect. Like a lot of the work I do right now is I, I actually go to stories that try to, as a way to kind of theorize or explain what's happening um, in our lives at the moment. And, and they're very instructive because when we didn't behave sustainably, ethically, morally in relation to the natural world, um, our ancestors or being responsible for future generations or other relatives or kin in the world, there were usually consequences and they weren't good consequences. So we would learn from that. Um, the difference is that we had our own ways of dealing with that. Um, now it's harder, it's harder to, to engage in the kind of work that we would like to um, engage in based on our own laws and governance um, authority um, and jurisdiction. But it always starts with spirit. That's the center um, of our existence um, in the teachings that I've been given um, over the years. And I'm always constantly um, reminded and where I've kind of seen a little bit of the difference, like I'm thinking about the very first time uh, a meeting I, I, I was uh, facilitating with uh, the Chiefs of Ontario in a downtown hotel in Toronto. <laughs> and now, because it starts with spirit, you try to have water, you try to have, try, try to be by the water, try to um, make sure that there's um, a sacred fire present. Like a lot of these, a lot of the gatherings have now generally switched to um, in my context, First Nation communities by the water, being in communities where there's fire keepers. So it's a very different context when you understand that it starts with that it starts with spirit because it'll bring in different um, aspects, I guess, of our lives um, into the conversation and into the meeting, like calling in um, calling in ancestors and and drawing on on their knowledge as well. So. Um, I, I also like to point out that, um, that we were complete societies. Um, I find in a lot of the, any, it, it doesn't even matter what kind of engagement that, that I, or the, what I call circles that I find myself in right now, a lot of it is, is climate change or climate, climate justice is how I like to frame it because there's still a lot of injustice um, in that whole conversation is just a lack of recognition that indigenous peoples um, were, were part of societies and nations and communities that were complete. We had everything that we needed to in order to flourish for thousands of years and interact with each other as nations. We had our own treaties with each other. Um, we had our own diplomacy and, and protocols. To me, that's an important starting point. Um, rather than just looking at indigenous peoples as these populations that need to be um, engaged with or consulted, but we are actually societies. And as societies, we had everything that any other society would have um, in order to function. So when you start from that place, you can see sort of the inadequacy of, of even now, even though Indigenous participation has improved, it's still not where, where Indigenous peoples would like to have it. Um, I'll speak more to First Nations. We have tribal members on the panel and they'll speak to to that um, to the tribal perspective more so more so than I uh, more so than I well I shouldn't really um, in in this presentation so so we had we had that and so so I find even within the Great Lakes initiative even though it's improved it's still within a certain there's certain assumptions that are there about um, about engagement with indigenous peoples, which is what it'll say rather than societies and nations and, and everything else. It fundamentally really doesn't recognize um, indigenous peoples as societies and nations. And that's how you will engage with indigenous people as opposed to, okay, let's try to get their participation and in, input into this or into this study or into this process or into this, um, into this initiative. So to me, this is a really important starting point 
to under to understand that. And that was thousands of years. And really, for me as an Anishinaabe person and my ancestors, most of most of my history um, and most of my uh, existence as an Anishinaabe person in connection to my ancestors and hopefully future generations. So that's really most of it. Um, and we need to um, we need to recognize that. So I'm also always reminded, particularly by Chief Dean Sayers and by Joanna, that um, he goes, don't ever start soft. We always have to assert our own authority and jurisdiction, our inherent rights to the Great Lakes. That's also forms a part of this, um, the whereas statements in this particular um, document uh, that was put together by Indigenous Council to the International Joint Commission like almost like four decades ago. And is this recognition of our own um, of our own jurisdiction and our rights and responsibilities, and the treaties that we have with um, with others, like with the with, with the state, um, once you know colonization started to happen um, in the territories, the treaties are different. So, so we have our own. So that we need to recognize this first. Like that's our starting starting point. Um, and again, this started to become reflected more. Um, in gatherings that, that I would uh, facilitate when we we're having conversations around the Great Lakes. And one of them would be, we'd always start with talking about the treaties. Um, it didn't matter who was present, like we talk about the treaties, the different treaties, the wampum treaties, so that that understanding was the starting point before we even get into, are we worried about aquatic invasive species or whatever happens to be the annexes of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, or in the case of um, Ontario, the Canada-Ontario Agreement, which helps um, Canada-Ontario deliver on the commitments made in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So we always have to start from our own government and our own governance um, looks different. Uh, so it's not, I think sometimes it was unrecognizable to, to settlers and others, and probably a lot of the times still not because there's so many diverse nations around the Great Lakes that we're not all the same. I'm Anishinaabek, but there's also Haudenosaunee, um, the, the, that, com uh, that confederacy, the Three Fires Confederacy, Menominee, like there's so many different, like it's so diverse and that needs to be um, recognized. That wasn't a problem for indigenous people because we had our own protocols and treaties we would make with each other. But it, I find uh, in working in, in government, they think it's a problem because they want like the one size kind of fits all to things. But that's not how it. That's not going to be effective um, on the ground at all. So, so again, this is what I've been instructed. Like, you must. We always start with spirit, and then we always assert our own um, jurisdiction and responsibilities in relation to the Great Lakes. Oops. So, yeah, that's just the introduction. Boy, um, I wonder how much time I have. Okay, so, uh, so that's part of the indigenous context. Um, our governance and treaties, and then uh, colonialism, but I'll talk about these in turn, um, in terms of what I hope to cover over the next half an hour. So I wanted to start with recognizing my own family. I think about um, my great grandparents. Um, actually, my grandmother was Botawatomi. Um, can't remember what state um, they would have fled from um, due to violence um, in, in her particular, um, community, but anyway, they came across the Great Lakes and settled on um, Manitoulin Island and um, uh, intermarried with the with the communities that were there. But I think about them in terms of how they were able to live, like they essentially lived by by the light because they didn't have running water, electricity or anything like that. So I remember we'd go visit them um, and uh, you went to bed when it was dark and you got up like in the summertime, that was pretty early, but they lived to me. I think about it now, I didn't appreciate it as a child, of course, but they lived very much by natural kind of rhythms um, going on around them. Um, and they didn't get caught up in all the trappings, I guess, of, of um, other kind of lives. Even when when the First Nation, they lived in um, Wicomacong, had a house, they actually preferred to live in, in the house that, that they had before. Um, so it was, so I, I realized that they, they knew things and they understood things and they could live in a very, um, they could respond to the natural world um, in ways that I would say hard for me because I actually spend a lot of time now with COVID um, in Ontario, we still have still very much a virtual existence. Not, not as much time as outside as we wanted. So I wanted to acknowledge my great grandparents for, for everything that they would have had to go through to enable me to, to be here and do know what I, um, what I know, which is extremely limited to what, um, to what they did. 
Um, I also wanted to acknowledge also, because this has been a um, major disruption in our lives. My grandmother and my mother um, both went to residential school. This is my mother. Um, and that's the residential school that, that she went to. Um, lots of bad things happened there. <laughs> I don't have to tell you about it. But what it means um, in terms of my work is like I, I kind of think um, that I've learned as much as I can learn in English about what, what I need to know about Indigenous knowledge systems, right? Like in um, people writing about it, um, maybe even talking about it. But really, it's kind of the, the lived experience that, that matters a lot that, that I'd often be missing, even though it's my career and I pay attention to these kind of things. But also, it's embedded within language. But because of this legacy, so my, my parents were fluent, my grandmothers, my grandparents were fluent, but I'm not. And I know that I am missing a lot because I'm not, even though I'm trying to learn, but I'm learning like, I don't know, probably not even junior kindergarten level. Um, when you're really trying to get the higher level concepts, the worldview, that's not a that's not enough to get it. <laughs> and there's only so much that could really be explained um, in English to someone like me. So it's really, it's actually had a really big impact on our ability or my ability, I'll speak for myself, my ability to actually kind of know things in a different way than I can know from being um, an academic or even when I'm working for First Nation governments or um, so to me, it's, I call it hitting the wall. Like, I feel like I've hit the wall. I can read a bunch more stuff, but it's not the same as actually um, deeply understanding something because you can actually follow um, conversations and, and teachings or even um, in ceremonies in the language. So it's been hugely disruptive in, in, um, in our knowledge. So for me, this is just, uh, I'll go through this a little bit faster. I'm part of the Anishinaabek Nation. Um, and that's my family. So over time in my career, I, I understand like that my responsibilities also change because of who I am before my children are born. And then when they were after um, my obligations to teach them to be um, uh, Anishinaabek um, people wherever they happen to be. So this is just an image of my dad and sons in the territories that I come from. Um, yeah, and I also I, I also like seasons. <laughs> I always point this out. Uh, so one is the image of where I'm from. I for sure also has Dreamers Rock, which is a spiritual area. People come from all over, visioning ceremonial sites. So we're the caretakers, um, caretakers for that. But also um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our governance was also around the. Um, it's actually one moon, but thirteen phases. Um, another story in terms of how I'm looking at that in terms of my. Um, climate change research, but also important to know that, um, especially when I'm, I'm speaking to an international audience that we had seasons, um, <laughs> there's winter and, um, and summer in, in our lives. And, and it, we learn different things during these times in terms of um, our knowledge systems. I wanted to point to these teachers who've, who've passed away because they were hugely influential in how I think, how I was able to switch from um, like thinking in English to, to trying to understand how people who think in the language think so differently. Um, I don't have time to get into the stories that I learned from them. So one is the late uh, grandmother, Josephine um, Mondaman, and the other is um, uh, the late Robin Green, who was um, the, uh, the grand chief for the treaty um, number, Grand Council Treaty Number Three in Northwestern Ontario. Anyway, they just—that's a come. I know there's a difference between when people think in the language. Um, the concepts are are really different <laughs> than when you're trying to understand them uh, from a, um, I guess, from an English um, from an English or colonizer, I guess, perspective, for lack of a better word. So I just wanted to acknowledge, like, just how they just totally opened my eyes and and had these major eureka moments in in listening to them. Our teachers are also the land and waters themselves. And this is part of our worldview and ontology, like how we how we learn and how we understand what's going on in the world, who our kin are and who our teachers are also comes from the land itself. Um, some of the, the work that I was doing around water, and this was in the Canadian context, there was you know, public policy around water, First Nation communities always being evacuated. Um, basically there's a, a water crisis in relation to um, First Nations. But 
but it was always important to Indigenous people. It wasn't until it was front page news on CBC or something like that, but it was always, uh, it was always important. Um, and it's always and continues to be a life-giving force for, um, for First Nations uh, in Ontario and around the Great Lakes. So that's just my, my dad and my son's fishing. So my son fishing. So this is a, re a reminder of just how different it is from when I was growing up and how this can happen in a single generation. So when I was growing up, um, we didn't have electricity or running water, anything like that either. That came a little bit later. So I grew up having to go get water down at the lake. So if you wanted, if you wanted water for drinking or for whatever, you went down to the lake, haul water and bring the water up. And, um, and probably it was when I, so this is how we, we grew up. Um, but maybe, I don't remember what year it is, maybe it was even graduate school. I remember going home and then you couldn't drink the water. You couldn't drink the water from the lake anymore. And I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of a big problem, um, even within um, my lifetime. At the time, also, the quality of the Great Lakes was um, impacting fish and contaminants in fish. And there were all these um, fish consumption guidelines, but they didn't really reach Indigenous communities because we ate fish all the time. And me at 15, childbearing age, according to all these fishing um, guidelines, I really shouldn't have been eating that much fish because they were because uh, they were contaminated. This wasn't really reaching Indigenous communities. I guess it's a type of a form of a um, injustice because Indigenous peoples also consume a lot more fish. And this is partly the result of um, the uh, Eagle Project, which then studied this particular issue. But um, but the reason I, I show my, my son here um, is because um, where, I, where I'm living right now, sometimes the, the pipes freeze for the water. And um, so I sent, so I said, okay, you got to go down to the lake and go get the water. This is like, was normal to me growing up. Um, so he takes the pail down to the shore and uh, comes back up and he goes, um, there's kind of, there's ice on the water. I can't get any. And then <laughs> I were just going, then you have to break the ice. Cause that's what we did too. We had to break the ice in order to get the water, even though it was minus 35 outside. Um, that in, even within a single generation, this, um, <laughs> this ability to be able to engage with water is, um, as life was, was starting to be, was starting to be broken because they just didn't have to do that. And, and when you go down to the water all the time, you're always engaging with water and you're understanding it over time when it freezes up and when it breaks up, um, that that was starting to be lost by, um, by water coming in um, in different ways um, into the communities and for um, for how we want to I guess how we want to live with water. So I remember at that moment feeling really alarmed. I go, okay, I have to do a better job now in terms of trying to make sure that um, you know that my own um, children understand what this relationship um, to water is. So I always want to recognize this because I'm in so many circles where people don't understand why colonization and in Canada through these particular reports, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Murdered, Missing and Indigenous Women and Girls pointed to clone, uh, cultural genocide of Indigenous peoples. Um, this matters, like people don't like to have this conversation when we're trying to have an Indigenous conversation or conservation or environmental issue conversation, but it matters for the reasons that I talked about um, earlier. I'm just going to check time because obviously I could get easily carried away here. So to me, it matters in conversations. Um, and, and as uncomfortable as it might make others, we do. Um, because the other side of it is that we're still here. So despite these genocidal policies, here I am, an Anishinaabek person, part of the Anishinaabek nation, you know, making it my life's work to try to understand, uh, you know, Anishinaabek understanding and also not only understanding, but also the ability to be able to engage with the natural world and, and water in the way that my ancestors did that, you know, contributes to um, sustain, sustainability or living well, um, living well with all our relations. So we're still here, despite all of that. So, so basically, we've, we've learned how to survive really terrible things. And so there's a lot to learn from Indigenous peoples around this because now, as you know, the COP meetings, the Conference of the Parties for Climate Change just happened. A uh, report, I call them the disaster reports come out. It's not looking good. This is a, a critical decade. Some changes are irreversible, but Indigenous peoples were able, to, were able to, to do it. Here we are and we have knowledge and our own laws and protocols and governance systems that can 
um, that enabled us to do that because it wasn't other people's solutions. It, it came from within ourselves and our own um, in our own communities and our own uh, our own knowledge um, systems. So there's a lot to learn from Indigenous peoples, I would say, um, right now. So this is just the obligatory picture where the First Nations are in the Great Lakes is about 63. Um, depending on where you draw the boundaries, there would be a bit more, because of course, water uh, drains into the Great Lakes. This isn't including the, um, the tribes, of which there's also um, many in the Great Lakes. So I'm uh, on Manitoulin Island or just on the North Shore. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the water declaration of the Anishinaabek, Meshkegawak, and, and Hongwe Hongwe. So as part of this, this work of this water crisis um, with First Nations in the Canadian and Ontario context, communities being evacuated every year, boiled water advisories, drinking water advisory for decades, um, the, in, in engaging with um, elders and traditional knowledge holders over several years, and many of them passed on. So like this is really, um, their knowledge that was shared with us is really to be cherished is a declaration um, was produced in 2008. And, uh, and this is just some highlights of it. I won't, I won't read them, um, and, but it's a whole declaration you can find on the Chiefs of Ontario, uh, Chiefs of Ontario website. But what it did was um, it's, it's been guiding um, any kind of interactions around water and the Great Lakes that we've been engaged in. So um, last week I just facilitated an, another meeting leading up to um, as part of the Canada Ontario Agreement, and again we talk about the Water Declaration. It sort of guides our actions, and what it does is it outlines our obligations um, and responsibilities um, to waters and what our rights are, inherent rights um, in relation to that, and what the state of the waters are, um, and what we would like to see um, happen. So there's so this Water Declaration has been um, been guiding. Um, guiding our work in relation to um, Great Lakes um, initiatives. And to some extent, it's been recognized, um, at least provincially, or that's what they said in the meeting last week. Um, but like you, I guess the, the, what I want to say about this is so when, when I find when um, Indigenous stuff is recognized, it tends to be, um, it tends to be kind of like in a little box somewhere under cultural consideration or something like that, as opposed to you're actually dealing with a political entity. And, um, and so, and, and often I find um, that happens, like it's in a little box and in, in the main report or something like that, or it's a consideration because people don't really know what to do with it. Like they don't fundamentally understand these kind of relationships that should be happening with indigenous people. So it's like, hey, what do we do with this? People are talking about inherent rights and like, I don't know where to put this in this strategy, this protection strategy. So, so like there's a real kind of lack of knowledge about, about what to do with it. And of course, you know, indigenous peoples find that unsatisfactory to be in a little box under considerations. And, and, but, you know, at the same time, it wasn't there two decades ago or even 10 years ago, but now at least, it's kind of in the radar, but we can do a lot better than that. I don't know why that's blank. So part of the, I wanted to talk about the Mother Earth Water Walks, and I know there's probably people on this call or on this uh, panel or this are participating today that have been part of these in their own communities. Um, but these are, these are taking up obligations um, inspired by grandmother uh, Josephine um, Mondaman. So she, what I really liked about, well, there's, I really greatly admire and, and, and love her. She was at residential school the same time as my mother was. So they knew each other from those days. Um, and she, she wasn't really motivated by whatever the governments of the day were saying. She was motivated by, again, that the center of everything is spirit and obligations and responsibilities to heal and to care for the waters. Um, so, and to me, I in, interpret a lot of this as, this concept of Mininabodzwin, spelled different ways. And, and I see that as being central to achieving um, justice, particularly water justice, um, that because it's in, it, centers, um, it centers the water as, as a living being, um, as having agency, um, and that we actually, as people, don't have the right to interfere with water's ability to be able to live up to its own responsibility. So it's a different sort of idea about what, um, what justice might look like. So those continue. 
um, and I, I hear about them all the time um, that you know people taking up these responsibilities and not waiting for permission or just going ahead and, and doing what they need to do um, to try to re-engage in this relationship um, and heal the waters. Those are just some images of her. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that her work influenced, um, I guess, Indigenous governance or Anishinaabek governance was the Anishinaabek Nation, the political territorial organization in Ontario established um, a Women's Water Commission. Um, and so as a way to try to guide um, what, you know, anything in relation to water might want to look like with the kind of input from, from women who would be appointed from their communities. And also the, um, a toolkit was designed around how to um, become an advocate in terms of advancing um, different um, perspective. And that's just um, an image of Autumn Pelche, who's, um, you know, I guess getting a little older, but a, a young uh, Anishinaabek um, water protector. So now I'm getting into the Indigenous leadership, so I think I might be able to be on time here. Uh, and so the, again, when you're starting from that premise that Indigenous peoples are societies and nations, we had our own ways of doing our thing for thousands of years, we still do it. So in 2004, um, the First Nation um, and tribes met. Uh, sorry, I have the the um, thingy in the wrong space should be First Nations and Tribal Water Accord in 2004, and uh, where you know tribes and First Nations got together in um, Niagara Falls to to set out what their um, obligations and responsibilities were going to be in relation to the um, in relation to water. It was I think it was um, in response to the, um, an issue of bulk export uh, from the Great Lakes, and these are just some of the highlights that's um, in this accord. You can still find it. You can Google this, except do First Nations and Tribal Water Accord and you'll, you'll find it and it has the, the signatories to this, but it basically points to how our ancestors inhabited Great Lakes since time immemorial, how traditional knowledge and science can work together to strengthen our understanding of what's happening um, to the lakes, um, must think about future generations, recognition of indigenous um, women um, and their leadership and role in relation to water, um, the importance of ceremonies and our connection to water is, is spiritual and, and cultural, as well as, um, you know, we're also in the realm of governance and, and the political and diplomacy kind of realms as well. There's a lot more that's, that's there, but I wanted to point out that, that we are still doing this. We are still living up to our obligations. We are still exercising our inherent rights and jurisdiction um, with each other in this effort to, um, to uh, enact our our obligations to uh, to the natural world and to the to the Great Lakes. Then there was the Anishinaabek Joint Commission, an interesting <laughs> initiative in 2011, uh, with um, uh, First Nations and tribes up around uh, Sault Ste. Marie area. And again, there was a four-day gathering um, in the Sault Ste. Marie um, area, and this um, and also this declaration. I pulled this from the declaration that was part of this um, part of this report. I'm not sure if, if you're able to find this one or not, but um, in, in public domain. But again, um, speaking to this commitment to traditional teachings and responsibility, that's a core aspect of, of what people uh, talk about in terms of our obligations. Um, they look to youth and future generations. Um, as leaders and citizens, we, we, we pledge to assert our inherent rights to fulfill these duties um, to water and engage in, in water protection activities and um, in our own community. So again, this isn't all of it, but just giving you a sense of, this is what indigenous and tribes and First Nation communities are doing. Like we're, we're engaging with each other as nations and it would be great if other folks started to, to recognize, um, you know, indigenous um, societies and nations as complete societies who have everything any other um, society would have. And it's not just, you know, plotting us into other frameworks and hoping for the best, but actually we want to, you know, self-determine our own um, research interests. And I haven't been able to get in the weeds in terms of what some of the meetings are like that I'm at, some of the content um, and substance that we talk about there. I'm happy to answer questions like that when we get to that part. I'm also super keen to hear panelists um, as well, because there's a lot more, a lot more to, um, to discuss there. And, and what is, what does that kind of look like in terms of what these uh, how these engagements um, play out. 
So um, these water walks, upholding Anishinaabek law, learning and acting how to be a good person, which means being good in relation to, um, to the natural world as, as well. Um, so we had our own laws that govern these kind of processes and they rarely come into the conversation, even though I find um, First Nations talk about this a lot. They'll say, well, we have our own laws, we have our own. <laughs> and, and again, I, I think folks who are hearing that don't quite know what to do, quite know what to do about that. Um, and again, this was um, in my own community, we, we developed a, a, water, um, a water governance or a source water protection um, framework. And we incorporated um, ceremonial life and spiritual life into it. Um, and part of it was really getting youngsters um, engaged and uh, grandmother Josephine Mondaman was there at the time um, to inspire the little ones. And this was just uh, the, the daycare folks having their little, um, uh, having a water walk and starting to learn their responsibilities. I look at it this way, like I'm in a law school. So in, in that kind of framework, only certain people get to practice law, but in an Ishtabic framework, this is my niece, she's two years old. She can enact those responsibilities. Um, as a young person, like you're, you, you, can, you can be really young and learn what these obligations and responsibilities are um, in relation to the natural world um, and in relation to water. So I just wanted to leave you with this, this from um, grandmother Josephine Mondaman, again, cause she continues to um, inspire um, in terms of how we're to think about future generations, like do, do our actions show love for future generations? Are we good ancestors? Because we're descendants. I'm a descendant of my ancestors and whatever it is that they needed to do to ensure I could be here to talk to you. Um, I tried to honor that, but I also have an obligation because um, I'll be an ancestor to, um, to future generations and do my act actions show love for future, um, future generations. So I'll leave you with that. We can get into the the weeds later, maybe with some of the dialogue and questions. And I'm looking forward to um, hearing my uh, other panelists and, and learning from everyone today and Chimigwech for having me. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. McGregor. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your insights. Um, I would, before we get over to the panel discussion, I would encourage our viewers to please um, continue to submit questions to the chat. Um, that we can take up during the Q&A portion and panel to debate. So let me go and introduce our panelists today. First, we have Dr. Crystal Ng, who is assistant professor at the University of Minnesota's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Dr. Ng received a community engagement award in recognition of her collaboration with tribal community partners on the first We Must Consider Manamin project. This was a collaboration among tribes, intertribal treaty organizations, and University of Minnesota faculty, staff, and students that prioritize tribal views on the cultural significance and ecology of wild rice and the policies related to it. Our next panelist, William or Joe Gravine, is a program manager with the Lac du Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Wild Rice Cultural Enhancement Program and a tribal council member for the Lac du Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. Joe recently partnered with a team of researchers, including Crystal, to study the decline of wild rice. And third, Bradley Harrington is the tribal liaison for the Minnesota DNR, where he coordinates the tribal consultation process. Bradley comes from the Milox Band of Ojibwe located in central Minnesota and was born and raised on the Milox Indian Reservation. He's a lifelong student of Ojibwe language and culture and has studied at the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, Central Lakes College, the University of Minnesota, both Twin Cities and Duluth, Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona, Tucson, and the Native Governance Center. He's received certification from the Native Nations Institute, the Blandin Foundation, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the White Bison Wellbriety. Welcome panelists. And we are going to start by taking some questions 
uh, from our audience. And as they are uh, popping up, we will take the first one. Um, and I guess any of you can answer, maybe Deborah, if you want to start, and then if the other panelists want to chime in with additional answers, we can uh, take those as well. I can't see all of the other panelists, but um, so I hope that you're all unmuted and that you'll just speak when, uh, when you have something to say. So the first question, um, can you describe a specific example of how traditional ecological knowledge might differ from Western scientific knowledge? Oh, well, I'll just start because I'm, I, I really would like there to be space for the, the co-panelists. Sure. I think probably one of the main um, the ones that, that I guess that I confront every time I'm in these conversations is that water is considered to be alive and having its own agency, um, its own personality. Uh, Grandmother Josephine used to talk about that, like each Great Lake had, it own, had its own personality. So that generally in these conversations, that's normal conversation, I think, to have when, I, when I'm in Indigenous circles, but not in other kinds of circles, not so much. People don't talk, water is a resource, water is H2O, um, water is commodity, it can be property. Um, so it's understood, um, it's understood very differently. I, th I think the way I would like, so even fundamentally that is completely, is different. So when you look at the World Water Report, I actually did analysis of this, like how, well, I, whether there are assumptions about water versus indigenous understanding um, of water, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. But that's one of the things that jumps out at me every single time I'm having these conversations. We're saying the same word, but we mean something different. Like mm -hmm. water is more than H2O to indigenous people, but. Happy to hear from my uh, from my um, co-panelists as well. Yep, thank you, thank you. Any of our panelists want to give us an example? Just remember to unmute yourself, Bradley. Honey, yeah. So um, yeah. Well, before I get going, I want to say miigwech to my fellow Anishinaabe that are on the call today. It's um really good to hear uh, uh, our people out there and people seeking out the knowledge and. Also, uh, miigwech to my fellow DNR people. I know that there's a bunch of Minnesota DNR people on the call today. Miigwech to you all and uh, MPCA. And a special shout out to Joseph Bauer Kemper, which I see he's on the list as well. My, my teacher from UMD, really great person. So um, the difference is, is actually why I don't have a degree in natural resources. I was, go, I was going to college for natural resources and learning Ojibwe language and customs at the same time. One of the ones that sticks out to me is uh, in forestry, we are to look at the tree and try to determine how much uh, money can be made off of it and board feet. But in Anishinaabe, the tree, <clears throat> the tree is a money do. The tree is a spirit that agreed to come help the Anishinaabe people by providing a great number of things as well as the ability to be burnt for warmth and heat. One of my elders here, uh, he always cracks jokes. Uh, a really funny guy, but he would say, you know, the sun is more than a ball of gas. It's um, money due that agreed to come shed light and give life to the Anishinaabe. And then of course, uh, Western science now says, well, you can't have life without the sun. And the Anishinaabe have known that for quite some time. Uh, another one is um, the moon. The moon is uh, what he likes to say. It's not a ball of Green Bay cheese, but it's also another money do. A money do that agrees to correct any ma any mistakes or wrongdoings. So then, uh, Western science wants to go and say that you know people are have an effect by the moon. People, you know, the, must be a full moon out. You know, people are acting a little strange. That's because little things are being corrected in in them there. So. But um, yeah, so I was learning Ojibwe language while going to college for natural resources. The example I always give though, is when I was uh, learning from the elders, one of them called me up and said, hey, would you come help me do a naming today? There's a baby that's searching for the Anishinaabe name. And I had to decline, it was midterms, you know, we get stuck in these uh, tendencies of American education and those midterms you can't miss so I had to decline coincidentally that day my midterm was on the scientific name of small mammals 
which I spent lots of time studying to make sure that I passed. But I thought to myself, I was like, I can be learning how to name an Anishinaabe baby today. What is the scientific name of a small mammal going? How is that? How is that going to help my people? And I decided then that I was going to stop going to school. I, I finished the semester. Don't worry. You know, I, I did. I, I finished off. But um, thinking about that, how was that going to help my people uh, was uh, one of the main drivers that pushed me out to mainly seek out what uh, from nature is going to be helping my people, right? And um, nature, uh, natural resources by definition is things found in nature that can be used for financial gain. Anishinaabe view it as things placed in nature because Anishinaabe are part of nature that can be used for uh, Minobamadizuin, it was referenced there spiritual physical uh, enhancement and well-being so uh, just my thoughts on it miigwech thank you uh joe or crystal you want to add any examples to that question yeah i guess i'll i can try to answer um i guess in my my experience you know um the um i guess the traditional ec ecological uh, you know that type of thing you know is and i can relate to what, what bradley has already said um i think you know between between uh tek and and uh you know western science um to me is 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 that everything's connected Everything has a connection, and and when we look at, um, let's say you know for instance water, you know there you know it doesn't I mean it, life doesn't exist without it basically you know when 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 you're dealing with wild rice, you know for, for example if you're looking at a watershed okay well you know where I'm where I'm from we we sit right smack dab in four watersheds, so let's look at the big picture. You know, it, it um, I guess that pretty much not, I don't know how I have have to say on that. You know. To, um, okay. Thank you, um, Crystal. Any examples from your experience where indigenous knowledge uh, differs from from Western scientific knowledge? Sure, I'm happy to contribute to this conversation too. But obviously, Deborah Bradley and Joe have. Um, much more to offer on this than than myself. I'm a uh, I'm obviously the odd person out here. I am a second generation Chinese American settler living here, and um, but I've had the great honor of working with tribal partners now, and I really just want to I think mostly echo what has already been said. I think that um, you know as Deborah was saying, just in the face of so much change today, climate change environmental degradation, we're all trying to grapple with how to deal with it. And, um, and I think we have so much to learn from Indigenous peoples and, uh, and their knowledge and their experiences. And I think one of the concrete examples I can give from our project is that, you know, all of us of the university researchers, we're all specialists in one thing, you know, like I am a hydrologist, so I can set up all kinds of computer models to simulate where the water is going to go. My, you know, colleague is a um, geochemist, and then we've got the social scientists who, who think about people. And uh, just as Joe was saying, what we're often really missing is how they're all connected. And I think to really solve these really challenging problems in front of us, um, we've got to figure out how to connect them, but we're not so good at that because we're all trained to not think about those connections. And so what's been just so valuable in our collaboration is having our tribal partners um, remind us to think about those connections, point out connections when we don't usually see them. Usually to me, water plus one other thing in the environment is interdisciplinary. And they're pushing us before we go out to do our field work you know, we're rushing out with just like our one thing to sample. And 
uh, you know, they remind us, take, take a moment to look around and think about how all the different beings are connected, you know, and we're like, no, we're in a hurry here, we need to get our samples. And they're like, well, you might just totally miss the major important aspect. And, you know, and that's why we now have, you know, Joe here is a, um, uh, he, he serves on graduate student committees, because we've realized that we're really missing a lot here. And so, and we've been really fortunate to have our tribal partners, a number of them being willing to share some of that knowledge with us. Thank you. So that kind of makes me think of something that several threads that came up in Deborah's presentation. And the the one is that, you know, the we're we're losing our ability to engage with water was the example that Deborah used, but I think I would say nature in general. And I mean, we have our college has a field station that's just 40 minutes north of the Twin Cities. And we bring school kids up there, you know, to, to see nature and experience nature. And for some of them, it's the first time they've ever been out of the cities. It's their first experience with nature as such. And they're terrified. They think they're going to get bitten by a snake or eaten by a bear or something. And it's, you know, so to, to keep that connection, and at the same time, um, Deborah was saying, you know, one of the, the kind of um, tenets is to look to the youth for energy and guidance, which I, I share. And I think that's probably something that keeps me working at a university. So how do we um, bring these two things together? If we want, we, we're, we're looking to our youth at, for the future, but yet at the same time, we recognize that they're losing connection with nature, how do we keep that connection strong in the future generations? Anybody who wants to throw in their thoughts on that. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at this here. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a book that was out not too, that would, came out a few years ago by uh, called The Last Child in the Woods. Um, so I think you know way way that uh, society is 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 going or is or has been going is that um, that uh, you know they're isolated and what I mean kind of mean by that is that we got gated communities um, and, and even uh, historical even in a historical context you know it's it's always nature has always been kind of uh, uh put in that in that category as someplace bad you know um you know you know you go you can go way back and you know i did did some reading uh, you know on, on religious you know type thing where you know people in the community misbehaved they got sent out out to the out to the wilderness to be punished you know and that you know <clears throat> so yeah that's uh see so how do we you know, so how do we engage, you know, our youth? And I think Deborah said it um, clearly, you know, that uh, we start that conversation with, with spirit. Anybody else want to add to that? We're all looking at each other. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to dominate the landscape. People heard me for 45 minutes. But All right, no one's jumping into this one, so. Bradley. Are you okay, Bradley, come on. Oh, honey. Um, what I think of is delivering the youth uh, very direct uh, knowledge uh, without, you know, trying to water it down. You know, the youth are a lot uh, more intelligent than we think. Anishinaabe believe that they are still connected to the spirit world a lot more than an adult all the way up until puberty. So they have access to energies that uh, are still uh, very mysterious. So to think that they are unable to comprehend any complex uh, scientific thought is uh, diminishing the power of the spiritual energy that they have access to. So uh, I, I've seen kids out there um, taking samples uh, uh, water uh, and then I've also seen them out there uh, 
uh, harvesting. You know, a, a really good example that one of my teachers gives is we go out in ceremony um, for about two weeks every year out in the woods. The kids are seemingly just running around, uh, right? Running around, playing, not being apart. But when it comes time for them to perform a certain part of the ceremony with a song, or when they're uh, in and around it, the kids know all the songs, even though they're not sitting there hour after hour, minute after minute, listening like how me as an adult would need to do. They're all running all, all outside the wigwam, but still when they come in, they're able to sing all the songs. So they're, they're just taking it in there. Another one, uh, and we did this recently, me and a, a friend of mine that we work in the cultural revitalization in Mille Lacs here, we did a presentation for a youth group. We talked about fasting, something that um, hasn't been done in, in my area for quite a while. And now because of that talk, we have a couple of kids that are actually interested in fasting in this coming spring. So we're gonna help gear them up for that. We've been providing sweat lodges for uh, some of the younger ones. Some as small as nine and 10 years old have been coming in there and we worry about their, you know, are they gonna be physically burnt or, but yet they're, they're able to come and climb in and climb out and go run and have a good old time. And I'm sitting there panting, trying to catch my breath. And it seemed like we're worried about some things that we shouldn't have to worry about, but giving them the experience in order for them to place that in their minds while they're still connected to the spirit world. So when they change, they still have access to that energy. Thank you. What I'll add to the conversation. Oh, Crystal, go ahead. Oh, is, is, um, cause I get asked this question a lot. And I think youth, um, as, as Bradley and William pointed out, they have this um, energy and they also, because we're working in these often institutions, I just say I'm institutionalized in a university, is, um, but they, so they have this capacity to be so innovative and so creative and so beautiful. Like they have this capacity to do that because they're not being constrained by, oh, I got this deadline, this funding deadline, I got to do this. So they, so they have this capacity to be able to do that. And I think embody knowledge in the way that, um, that Bradley talked about. So, so what I say is you can go out and you can start like using your senses and going beyond the senses to actually learn through your body, like um, through different ways. You're going to remember what it was like. Like when I think about climate change, they can start making those observations now. Like they can start connecting what, like did the leaves fall at the same time? Doesn't matter where you are, there's probably leaves falling. You can see the moon even in downtown Toronto. Like there's still a natural world that's there for people to connect to, um, connect to in, in some way. I think they just sometimes need a bit of guidance because they actually have a lot of that. Uh, if you can, if you can get um, get young people outside. So I think that's probably. I actually make my class do it, and it kind of freaks them out. Like it doesn't matter whether it's first year law or the graduate students that I teach. You're going to go outside, and you're going to start trying to learn from the natural world. And you can imagine how that kind of freaks out law students. Um, so <laughs> that they, what do you mean I'm gonna learn from the natural world? Well, I said, well, surely you're seeing something like what are the trees doing? What are the, and so they're, they, they and the, the younger the students are, the easier they find doing it because they don't have all the, the hangups that we kind of educate mm -hmm. them into, like where we just, we value books more than you know, what your body's experiencing. So I think they have that, um, they have that capacity to do that and we kind of educate it out of them. Um, I hate to say, cause I'm an educator. And so now I'm trying to undo that years later and, and try to get them like, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? And usually people are trying to avoid things like get cold. They don't want to go like, no, like embrace that. Like, what does that actually feel like? Because it should be cold in January and when it's not, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think they have the capacity, um, probably better than I do now because I'm so, in this world where I'm not as outside as, as much as I would like to. So I just wanted to build a little bit on what mm. um, William and Bradley talked about. That's great, thank you. Well, let me go to, we have some questions uh, popping up here. The first one's kind of a long one, so I'm gonna read it out and uh, whoever wants to answer can. So with regard to trying to facilitate indigenous participation, 
How do you integrate these diverse sources of knowledge in political systems that are only really designed to consider a very particular type of information, like peer-reviewed written Western science? Uh, this may be, oh, <laughs> the, yeah. Bradley, the suggestion is you might want to take this um, from, from your working with the DNR if you have uh, experience in that area. Not to put you on the spot or anything. Okay, well, um, how, you know, generating Indigenous participation is like what my job is, right? As a tribal liaison, as a, oh, that's uh, one of my main responsibilities what's outside the control though is the understanding of traditional knowledge or any other perspective that's being conveyed i wish that you know things are just so easily can be expressed absorbed and taken in but a, a lot of times there's a blockage there that people may put on a sort of blinders for themselves to help their own narrative continue on and both sides do it, it it's not just a, a one-sided thing um how it gets integrated though i think it's going to be over time right now when we're working with uh a, a, an american governmental system we we can see that it's specifically designed for a few to have benefits to have great benefits uh, the social benefits that the government puts out are are kind of like there to to help people believe that they're getting something out of a larger government, but uh, what they show, uh, you know, is a little rabbit with a hat. But behind the scenes, there's this big complex system going on to where, while we're staying entertained or our attention diverted, uh, we can believe that uh, there's something uh, that we are getting. With that said. A lot of people that I work with in the Minnesota DNR, and they, and um, I want to believe that it's uh, for anybody that gets into an environmental field, they don't pursue environmental education to exploit it. And that's something that I've, I've come across. I haven't met a researcher or bi biologist said, you know what, I got into fisheries biology just to make sure that no one else can have it. They're there getting that education to of uh, help and preserve it uh, for generations yet to come a healthy environment right so what i find also are a lot of the barriers are the laws you know these governing systems they built a whole uh, a set of governing structures that ensure that some people benefit uh try to um blockade other people into a certain box where benefits may be viewed as as uh as constrained but in reality you know i think in the long run it's going to be education and something that a part of um, tribal state relations training we've seen the education go 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 and go and then my partner dnr is i hold follow-up meetings with with the dnr staff and i get to hear some of the greatest uh ideas on how not just to work with tribes and tribal knowledge, but how to work with tribes and their capabilities and capacities. So then it starts turning into not just an environmental justice thing, but now a societal justice thing where people are able to be diverse, but yet still share with a common goal. Um, I like that in their peer reviewed written in Western science because Anishinaabe knowledge is for the most part spoken and Anishinaabe knowledge is more than peer reviewed. Our Anishinaabe knowledge has been peer reviewed for thousands and thousands of years. Just because we didn't write it down doesn't mean that it has been peer reviewed. Also, it's been reviewed by the spirits and who else, uh, who, who, who else can be of such a great, uh, uh, give, give great perspective to what we're doing here, especially with the gifts that the money do have given us. So. Just because it's not right, written down doesn't make it true. I can write down almost anything, any lie, and <laughs> it still won't be true. <laughs> Good Which point. Is. Good point. Anybody else want to add a perspective on that topic? 
I'll just um I'll just add, yeah, but all fake news and stuff like that, right? <laughs> like right. Just, is um when when I talk about you know indigenous people as nations and societies, we also had our own knowledge systems. And I always say systems as opposed to knowledge. People want to extract knowledge from communities, but kind of forget about the people. Um, like no, you gotta you gotta work with people. Is that so we had our own systems for as as Bradley pointed out, for how we like what knowledge we are going to be using. So we had like who our experts are. Um, they, they're not me with a PhD, believe me, like don't trust me to go out on the ice and figure out when the best time to go is like, don't, do not. So we had our own experts. We had our own ways of, of deciding what knowledge um, was going to be passed on. So we had our own systems, just like we're all part of a system. I'm part of a university system. And then there's conferences and then there's peer review. And sometimes I think people didn't even read the paper. It's like the, the whatever doesn't even make sense. But you know, but but in, Indigenous peoples also had their own systems for how we governed knowledge for, um, and so I think that also needs to be kind of recognized. It's not just random, um, that it's actually part of a system and part of a society that's been there for thousands of years um, and, um, and worked that others can learn from. So even sharing with others, um, that needs to be recognized that sometimes there may be some things that can be shared and some things not because of protocols that exist um, within the system itself and and who's considered to be um, an expert. So that's what I try to explain. Like we have our own, we have our own system, just like I'm in a system and I can see it clearly, um, the differences because I operate um, in both. So it's a good, uh, a good question. So to take a concrete example, I wonder if Crystal and Joe can talk a bit about your project um, on Manumin and how that project maybe evolved over time to take account of both ways of knowing. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Joe, would you like to go first? Well, I'll, I'll let you go first, ladies first. Oh, there dear. we go. <laughs> uh, it definitely evolved because absolutely, I think there are a lot of differences that really serve as barriers. And I would say one of which is the piecing of things, you know, like I was a, um, I was tenure track, which means I'm being scrutinized for, am I gonna be producing those peer reviewed papers that everyone's talking about? But really to be doing this work, it's about connections and it's about relationships, right? Why would someone, you know, why would any tribal member trust working with us given the history that a lot of um, that has happened between University of Minnesota and, and many of the tribes around us. And so, um, so a lot of it was realizing that we had to recalibrate and we had to take a approach things with a timeline that's different. And, you know, we thought in our first two years, we'd be, you know, getting all kinds of samples and pumping out even more papers. But, um, you know, luckily, a lot of the I would say not tribal partners to begin with, but honestly just tribal contacts who were fortunate enough to have just taken the time to point out where we were uh, going wrong. Um, we instead just really just took those two years to get to know each other and spend time, you know, at Monoman Lakes and streams together. And, and for us university researchers to go out to reservations to, to listen to people. So yeah, I think there were that that was having to accept that, you know, things should be done at a different pace. And why were we willing to do that? I think it's all the things that we were just hearing from Bradley and Deborah. It's it, I think it's education, education on my part of, of and, and many in our team who didn't realize what were the important aspects, but like being educated and realizing that this was what it should take and dialogue, you know, like um, not just hearing that this is what it takes, but just hearing, you know, what that spirit means to, to people, the spirit that Monoman has and, and hearing it directly, you know, as a scientist who doesn't usually talk about spirits, but just hearing someone earnestly talk about, you know, a be Monoman wild rice, having being a being and being a relative you hear that directly from someone and all of a sudden you, you're gonna you will feel compelled to do something that might not be the usual uh timeline for things and uh and maybe then at this point i might even just say i hope everyone on this 
call here is being educated by what you're hearing from Deborah, Bab, Bradley, and Joe, and think about what you can be doing in your work to maybe change that institution that Deborah was talking about. You know, do you play a role in uh, maybe deciding timelines for projects? Um, and can you alter that? Or, you know, do you play a role in reviewing an application to bring in someone with a more diverse background to help educate people in your institution? Um, so I think, you know, that's how, how we learn by, by talking, by listening actually more than talking with um, our tribal part co contacts who became tribal partners. And, um, and so, so I think that there's that shift. I think that's the way I, I, we've been experiencing it. Great, Joe, you wanna add to that? Yeah, you know, uh, I guess when, when, when I first came on board with this with uh, the wild rice program here, we were just beginning that, that conversation with the University of Minnesota here becoming a partnership. And uh, and to I never foreseen where where this would end up or how it progressed. But I, I think, you know, um, you know, through the, through the conversations and you know, talks and you know, a lot of the sharing, you know, that, that, that we've done, you know, with, with, uh, with this project and um, with Crystal and, and the team that, um, you know, and I, I think back, you know, um, to one of our, our, our Zoom calls we had back then, the conversations was is that, to really, to really get a, a, a good understanding, you know, you have to be on the landscape, you know, and I think, you know, you have to, you know, can't just go out there and, and collect the sample, you know, and and I, I know we here, here in uh, Washwagening, you know, we, we shared, we shared many, many experiences with, with this project, and I think that's been real, real helpful and and for me you know as as, as an Anishinaabe person you know we talk about trust you know, we talk about those past harms for me able to to process and kind of put that aside and, and focus on I guess uh, my responsibility as a wild race technician program manager to focus on that and, and and move forward so you know so we you know so us here, we had to kind of, you know, kind of tread, you know, softly and, and and see. And and I know for me and 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 some of the other uh, um, people on the project here in in um, Washington was is that that um, you know when 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 we hear when we hear that uh, you know respect responsible research you know so you know for me I, I take that word I take what somebody tells me you know pretty serious and 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 then so that that's been proven you know through this project you know working with crystal and um, and share and and you know the different um, you know ed, you know our culture and and some of the education you know on like for me i don't know nothing about really hydrology but you know or even sediment for that for that fact matter you know but uh you know it's just uh uh coming from coming from a a, um, a person that hunts fish and gathers um i understand you know how the, how the system works but you know, we got uh, these little, uh, what do you call them, chemical abbreviation, you know, number CA2A or whatever you want to call it, you know, it stands for something. But, you know, when, when it's explained, so that type of sharing was going back and forth. And, and it's just, uh, you know, been real, um, it's been real um, welcoming, I guess, for lack of better words, is, is that, uh, you know, we invited, we shared some of our ceremonies with, you know, with, with Crystal and, and the students there. We had our wild rice feast, you know, that every year since the project started, they, they have attended and, and, you know, a lot of gift sharing, you know, um, you know, just different things like that. And, and it's just, it's, 
it uh, that this whole relationship, this project has become on a more personal, a more personal level, I guess. You know, um, uh, you know, we talk about relationships and friendships. That's that's going to carry us on. You know, to do um, do the work that we need to do. Honestly. Thank you. That was great. Well, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, I'm not sure we can unmute participants. I think technically, Deborah, it's part of the webinar system. I think I'm not the technical expert, but um, let's take one more. And I think this is a general enough one that hopefully you'll all have a, a, a brief perspective on. Um, how can we continue to learn? And I'll leave it at that and leave that open. From each other, perhaps I could add. Oh, go ahead, Brad. I was going to nominate Crystal. <laughs> she hasn't I, went first say, I wanted to go first so that I'm not the last person to speak. That's the only reason. I would say, um, I think we've already answered that question. I think we need to be spending time outside together. And having sharing food together is very lovely as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Who wants to go next? How can we continue to learn from each other? I guess I'll, I think, um, I mean, I guess for many years I was in the same position as Bradley at Environment Canada. And again, I would just encourage um, to engage with people like on their, on their terms, as opposed to going into a community or going into a meeting and going, okay, how am I gonna get these people to like buy into my thing? Like, I'm like, no, like that's not, <laughs> That's not what this meeting is supposed to be about. This is being able to listen and like listen like honestly. And what I mean by listening honestly is is being prepared to be uncomfortable sometimes because Indigenous peoples all the time are working in other spaces where we're uncomfortable and not welcome a lot of the times, right? And so, but we persevere because you want to, you have this common goal and common objective. So I just encourage people to to um, to be there. Like if there's events and things going on wherever you are, whether you're in a university or in a community, if there's if there's something that in, Indigenous peoples are hosting, like show up and learn and be prepared to, you know, um, I mean, a lot of times it's, it's pretty, if it's public, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's meant to be celebratory and whatever else, but sometimes things are going to be in, in some situations um, uncomfortable because you're learning about a truth you never heard before. And, and that can make people get, um, <laughs> Sometimes they don't deal with that very well. Um, so I would say like, just, I, I guess it's sort of like almost learning to be mature and grown up and just realize that your version of the world isn't the only one. And you have to be open to other ones to really honestly kind of, um, kind of listen. So once you get there, like once you have to have the courage to go, and then once you get there, you have to have this, um, this openness and knowing that there's a history um, where people are coming from. I've been in meetings where people say, oh, that history is not relevant. Oh, and that just makes people so angry. Like that's one of the best ways to make people angry. You don't want to start off in a meeting making people angry. If that's what they want to talk about, that's what they're going to talk about. So I think, um, yeah, people willing to be um, responsible. Um, and, and sometimes you are going to be uncomfortable and starting to, starting to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable, I guess I would say. And, there, and there's going to be some truths because every community is unique. Don't assume they're all the same. You went to this one, it's great. Go to another one, I'm like, oh my God, what happened? They're different. There's yeah. different histories there. So, so that's that would be the advice um, that I would give in like 60 seconds. All right, thank you. Bradley, you wanna add anything about how we can continue to learn from each other? Or Joe, I see Joe's unmuted, so. Yeah, I'd just uh, say ditto to what's already been said, you know. Um, it's, yeah, it, uh, don't don't deny that uh, you know what's what's been uh, the history. You know, don't deny that. Okay, great, thank you, Bradley. Last word. 
Well, um, yeah, just to uh, express again what's already been said is, you know, getting to know each other is how the knowledge gets passed because, you know, well, it, well it's, um, well, it may be written in a book somewhere, you know, that's information. And then you have to take the time to go out and apply it. And usually that's with somebody else anyway. And then it, then it becomes knowledge, you know, and it, there's actual there. And remember, if um, anybody is going to go out and start um, Googling resources, which I do encourage, remember that our histories and our perspectives normally weren't written down, but they may have been written about. So sometimes there's a, a, a nuance there that we have to filter through also. And right now I'm in, I'm in a knowledge um, gathering stage of my life, right? And uh, when they talk about uh, ecosystems, ecology, the, the environment, it may not come in a very direct question, but just in a story of them uh, of an elder saying that you know what I was out with my grandpa and we we're out walking the woods the snow was melting and then they heard the frogs croaking and he goes oh it's time to pull our maple taps just in that little short sentence there that little short story was uh, a few different teachings there on what to expect when 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 the spring comes in regards to sap running the ice pulling away from the shore and the frogs croaking you know, the, 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 they all signify different things and, and it's wrapped up in stories rather than research and uh, research papers and, and what we've come accustomed to with uh, American education. So go out, uh, meet some new people. I, I can tell you that Anishinaabe people are the, some of the most funniest people that you're ever going to meet. So I'm really going to go encourage you to go, go meet a few of us. Um, Show up at a powwow if you see. Uh, uh, now there's a bunch of Zoom talks. I see Anton Troyer is putting on a bunch of Zoom talks. There's uh, uh, winter storytelling over virtual now there. If you see one of those come about, there's tons of teaching in those funny stories there too. You just got to get acclimated to speech patterns and perspective uh, uh how they put this perspective together. But once again, I really greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Miigwech. A good note to end on. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks to all of our panelists and to Dr. McGregor um, and to all of you viewing us at, at home and online for your partici participation today. Um, this concludes today's program. If you enjoyed it, visit Freshwater's website to make a donation for healthy water and indigenous perspectives. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this lecture will be available to stream anytime from Freshwater's website and a link will be emailed to everybody who is registered for the event um, within the next day or two. So thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye everybody.